These and other channel supporters make my videos possible. We're going to turn this into this. Thanks to our friends at PCBWay, who were kind enough to supply the PCBs and 3D prints for this build. What is this? It's a Pico Gus. What's a Pico Gus? We'll get to that very soon, right after the intro. My story starts with a computer. How does yours? The Pico Gus is a Raspberry Pi Pico powered ISA card for your vintage computer that emulates various sound cards. Those sound cards include the Gravis Ultrasound, or Gus, hence the name of the project, Adlib, MPU 401, Tandy 3 Voice, and the Creative Music System, or Game Blaster. Important caveat Due to the specs of the Pico, assumptions made by programs written to use the GUS, the imprecise nature of emulation, and the varying specs of retro DOS PC hardware, some things will likely never be perfect. Keep in mind that the Pico GUS is still a work in progress, and the information in this video is accurate as of May 2023. The Pico GUS already supports a large number of demos, trackers, music players, and games in Gravis Ultrasound mode, and also works with almost anything in Adlib and CMS modes, including auto detection in CMS mode, except for programs that use the Adlib for PCM out. The MPU 401 and Tandy 3 voice lists are shorter, but I'm sure more games will be compatible as the firmware is improved. When PCBWay reached out to me to see if they could sponsor a project on my channel, it didn't take me long to pick the Pico Gus as the project, as it would let me try PCBWay's 3D printing services in addition to their PCB manufacturing. And since this is my first time ordering from PCBWay, I thought an unboxing of my order would be appropriate. Let's take a look at the free 3D printed transparent logo included with my order. I now see why Javier had his transparent floppy drive parts printed by PCBWay in this resin. This is an impressive 3D print. I had five of the PicoGus brackets printed in UTR8220 resin. This resin seemed to be a good fit as the description of this material stated that UTR8220 printed parts have high precision and good dimensional stability. It is suitable for functional testing and product processing with higher requirements for toughness, excellent temperature resistance, can maintain the strength, toughness, and dimensional stability of the product at 65 degrees C. And while I could have had PCBWay finish the parts for me, I wanted to see what the parts looked like direct from the 3D printer. As for the warped bracket, PCBWay did warn me that this could happen with thinner resin printed parts and they suggest using a heat gun or hot water to return the bracket to its original shape. That, combined with attaching it to the PCB, should do the trick. Speaking of PCBs, let's check out those PCBs in Gravis Ultrasound Red. I had the PCBs manufactured using the red solder mask as an homage to the red PCBs used by the original Gravis Ultrasound. I chose the Hazel with Lead surface finish, as suggested by the PicoGus build instructions, as Hazel is thicker and can possibly take more wear than can the ENIG finish. I would like to once again thank PCBWay for sponsoring the project build in this video by supplying these PCBs and 3D printed brackets. 
For your next project, visit PCBWay.com and see what PCBWay can do for you. Now, on to the build. I am going to follow the assembly instructions on the PicoGus wiki as they appear to be in shortest to tallest component order. I also appreciate that the instructions let you warm up by soldering the small outline integrated circuit or SOIC parts before tackling the intimidating thin shrink small outline package or TSSOP parts. That's followed by the small outline transistor, or SOT parts, the 0805 parts, the diode, the Raspberry Pi Pico itself, the header pins, the digital to analog converter module, the electrolytic capacitors, and finally, the MIDI jack. Let's get started. In the interest of time, I'm only going to show installing the first of each surface mount component in real time, then speed through installing the remainder of each surface mount part, as well as all the through hole parts. When installing the parts, watch out for component orientation. The silk screen indicates pin one by use of a slightly longer line. The component package indicates pin one with a circular mark or notch. After aligning the chip, I tack opposite corners, double check that the chip didn't move, then solder the remaining pins. You might notice that I align these SOIC parts up without the use of a microscope, but I will double check alignment under the microscope once the TSSOP parts are soldered. U5, U6, and U8 all go on smoothly. Now, onto the TSSOP parts. I start to align U3 without the microscope then realize that the pin pitch is small enough that I need the magnification. You're seeing the camera view of my stereo microscope, which shares the view of the left eyepiece, and not a very well-centered view at that, but I digress. To tack these chips, I tack one corner, refine alignment and tack the opposite corner, then come back around to reflow the first pin to refine alignment and relieve any stress on the pin.
I'm then going to apply copious amounts of flux and attempt to drag solder the chip. I'll fix any solder bridges and then repeat for the other two TSSOP chips. Once I have the first six ICs installed, I clean the flux off the board to get a better view of my work under the microscope. The SOIC chips all look good, but U2, U3, and or U4 are going to cause me trouble later. Something was telling me to reflow these three chips during this inspection, and in hindsight, I should have done just that. Next on the assembly instructions are the two SOT-235 components designated U7 and U9. After soldering the TSSOP chips, the wider pin spacing is a welcome relief. And now, it's capping time! Along with the rest of the passive 0805 components. The 0805 refers to the imperial unit dimensions of the component, which is 0 0.08 inches by 0 0.05 inches. In metric, that's 2 millimeters by 1.2 millimeters, or a 2012 component. But since they're called out in the Bill of Materials, or BOM, as an 0805, that's what I'm going to call them in this video to minimize confusion. When installing the capacitors, C3 through C9 are all the 0.1 microfarad capacitors, and C10 is the 1 microfarad capacitor. If you're concerned about mixing these up, you might consider soldering C10 first. Likewise, when installing the resistors, R1 and R2 are the 10 kiloohm resistors, 
R3 is the 10 ohm resistor, and R4 is the 33 ohm resistor. Since the resistors look the same, I would recommend opening and installing only one value at a time. And because ferrite beads L1 and L2 look like resistors, only open and solder these after you get all four resistors. These four components would be difficult to rework later due to the proximity of the MIDI jack, so take a few extra minutes of care while installing them. The next component to tackle is the power protection diode D1. The cathode of the diode is marked with a line or set of lines, and the cathode goes towards the top of the board, denoted on the silk screen as the closed side of the box. I had trouble seeing the lines, even under the microscope, but I've highlighted what you are looking for to confirm proper orientation of the diode. Fortunately, the large pins make soldering easier than seeing the cathode mark. Next up is the Raspberry Pi Pico, and there are two ways to install it. You can install pins on the Pico and sockets on the Pico Gus so that you can swap the Pico out with other projects. Or you can do what I did here, and that's using the castellated edges to solder the Pico directly to the Pico Gus. Just make sure to use plenty of flux if surface mount soldering the Pico to the Pico Gus. Once the Pico, or the sockets for the Pico if you so chose, are in place, you can install the pin headers for the IRQ and DMA jumpers, UART transmitter, and the I2S digital to audio converter module. Before you solder the digital to audio converter module, be sure to check the solder jumpers on the bottom of the module. Some folks have received these modules with no jumpers in place. In order for the module to work properly, double check the bottom of the module against the photo in the build instructions. Hey! We're almost done soldering. It's time to get the final components installed. Two electrolytic capacitors and the MIDI jack. Note the polarity of the capacitors. Electrolytic capacitors have the stripe on the negative side and the board is marked on the negative side as well. Now that all the components are installed, I gave the board a quick clean in the ultrasonic cleaner for 20 minutes per side, rinsed the board with distilled water, and put it through a 90 minute bake cycle in my reflow oven at 65 degrees Celsius to dry it. 
It's time to install the jumpers. I'm going to jumper mine to use an IRQ of 5 and a DMA of 1, which is typical for Gravis ultrasound emulation. After painting the bracket off camera with gray spray paint, as I don't claim to be a painting expert, I attached the bracket to the Pico Gus using M3 screws I bought at my local hardware store. Shout out to Randy's Do It Best Hardware, hashtag not a sponsor. If you didn't install the Pico Gus firmware onto the Pico before installing it, now's the time to do it, as it's time to test our work. Updates can be done from DOS, but the initial firmware needs to be installed over USB. I added header pins to the location indicated in the assembly guide for out-of-system programming. If you added this header too, only connect it for out-of-system programming of the Pico. Putting the Pico into programming mode is easy. Simply hold the button on the Pico while plugging in the micro USB cable and a drive will appear on your computer. Simply copy the UF2 file to that drive and the Pico will automatically eject once programming is complete. Don't blink or you'll miss it. Time to power it up and no smoke. To use the Pico Gus in Gravis Ultrasound Emulation Mode, you need to download and install the Gus 4.11 software at the link provided in the configuration page. After the Gus software is installed, you need to set up the ultrasound and ultra dir environment variables either in autoexec.bat or on the command line or both so that you don't have to restart to reload autoexec.bat. Note that I am configuring my Pico Gus to use port 240, IRQ5, and DMA1. Finally, run pgusinit.exe to initialize the Pico Gus. If running it report success, your Pico Gus is working. And my Pico Gus was not detected. Oh wait, I just realized that I had another sound card installed. So maybe that was conflicting. I'll try again after removing that card. Oh. And it's still not detected. Wah, wah, wah. Looks like I'm going to have to reflow those TSSOP chips after all. Oops. I didn't get that on camera. Sorry. After reflowing those three chips, the Pico Gus is detected. Yay! Let me update autoexec.bat to initialize the Pico Gus every boot. Then it's time to play some games to test it. I've picked a few games from the compatibility list to try. First up is Jazz Jackrabbit. I remember playing the shareware version back in the day, just not with Gravis Ultrasound sound. This is going to be awesome. Jazz Jackrabbit. He's one mean, green, fighting machine. Woohoo! Indeed. Is it me, or is the right side of the screen cut off? 
Maybe it's just my scaler acting up. It's not supposed to do that. Wow, the system is really locked up and the three finger salute is having no effect. I'll have to use the reset button to recover. Yes, I might have left this part in for some foreshadowing. Make your guesses in the comments as to what you think the problem is. Okay, Jazz Jackrabbit is supposed to be compatible, so I'm going to try it again. New game and not again. Next up is Raptor, Call of the Shadows. It's also on the compatibility list. Let me install and configure it real quick. Yeah! Apogee Software! But again, what's up with the screen? It's not supposed to do that. Another lockup. The wiki says that many games use DMA for sample upload and or streaming audio playback, so are not expected to work 100% currently. Maybe that's my problem, though the wiki says these two games work perfectly. I'll try another game. How about Descent? It's also noted as working perfectly. Okay, I can clearly see that the last column of characters is cut off. Why is my scaler being so mean? Video tests work, so maybe Descent will be the lucky game. It's not supposed to do that. It didn't even make it past the Interplay logo. I'll try again, but I'm going to disable using the Pico Gus for music playback. Maybe I'm having DMA issues with this chipset. Okay, we're getting further. I'm going to zip through this boring part. Let's get to the game! It's not supposed to do that, either. Logic dictates that the Pico Gus must be the culprit, because the computer only locks up when it is playing music. 
However, why have I seen all the little graphical anomalies too? Therefore, I'm going to pull this quote known working Trident video card and replace it with the Cirrus Logic video card. So far, so good. Those two little rectangles are gone this time. And the second E in shareware isn't cut off. Sounds great, even if my gameplay is not so great. Gameplay is quite terrible. Let me try another game. And we've already made it further. And again, 
The screen isn't cut off. to play this game. It's getting quite late and this video is getting quite long, so I think now is the time to bow out and wrap this video up. I'd like to thank our friends at PCBWay for providing the PCBs and 3D prints for this build. The PicoGus build gave me the opportunity to practice soldering surface mount chip types that I don't normally get to solder. I enjoyed building it and look forward to gaming with it when it's not so late. If you're a retro gaming enthusiast that likes to play games on real vintage hardware, then you're probably going to want to try to find a Gravis ultrasound card. However, given their rarity, they command a high price when they do show up. The PicoGus offers a good alternative for enjoying many titles designed to utilize the Gus and can even emulate other sound cards. And while your goal might be one day to acquire an actual Gravis ultrasound, the PicoGus could help you bridge that gap. I'm certainly glad that I built a PicoGus and look forward to trying it out with more games and even with it in its other emulation modes. Is there something that you would like me to check out on the PicoGus? Let me know in the comments! And while you're there, please consider subscribing and turning on notifications so that you don't miss any follow-up videos. Thanks for joining me on my adventure with the PicoGus. And until next time, take care. These and other channel supporters make my videos possible. You can become a channel supporter too on Coffee or Patreon with tiers starting at just $1 or local currency equivalent and your name in the credits starting at five. Coffee tips count too. For more information, visit my coffee page at coffee.com slash jdmcs or my Patreon page at patreon.com slash jdmcs. Links are also in the video description below. Maybe we've got a finally working Trident card here. Hooray! Yay!